And good morning to all of you. Let's see that. The good news, uh, you don't have to take any notes at all. I'm going to keep it uh, simple. But actually, what just last week, we completed a report that describes everything Metropolitan does about seismic resilience. And this is now available on our website. So anything that I summarize today will be explained in detail in this. OK, and now uh, my presentation, is it? Yeah. OK. All right. And could I turn one of these screens or? Okay, I'll just uh, be giving an overview of what uh, Metropolitan's doing in the area of seismic resilience, tying a little bit to how this approach developed over time. And a few background slides just to, sh just to show you the main areas of seismic risk for Metropolitan, things that we're thinking about. And then we'll get into our strategy. And we have a something that we really took a couple steps back. We've been doing a lot of things well for many years, but a couple years ago, uh, Chief Engineer asked us, take a look at what we're doing, what can we do better, what areas might there be gaps, how can we fill them? And so what we came up with is an uh, integrated approach between our planning um, group, long-term planning, that's water resources, engineering, and then operations, on the operations side, it's primarily the emergency response. It's, and, and we'll get into this and describe each one of these. We added in a reporting function that we didn't have before, kind of coordinating between all these groups and then reporting on it and going to our board on a regular basis to talk about what we've done and what we plan to do in the next couple of years. Another new item, in 2015, we added a Seismic Resilience Water Supply Task Force, and this is coordinating between Metropolitan, uh, LAD de uh, Department of Water and Power, and the California Department of Water Resources. So I'll get into all these things. But uh, first, a little bit about Metropolitan. I think most of you understand who we are. We're a wholesaler. Um, we have 26 member agencies. We serve five counties, from Ventura to San Diego. And this is what you see in the yellow at the bottom of the diagram. And this area that you see, Metropolitan Service Area, has 90 million employees. So we understand the importance of water to the economy. We understand the importance of restoring water after earthquakes. Uh, there's about half that area supplied by imported water. And real quickly, LA Aqueduct constructed about 1913, put in service. 30 years later, roughly, the Colorado River Aqueduct. Another 30 years later, we're getting water from the State Water Project here in Southern California. What are we concerned about? OK, seismic risk. Uh, just like in LA, the, the Bay Area has a lot of seismic faults. And those can impact uh, water deliveries through the State Water Project in, uh, if you have failures of the levees in the Bay Area. So I'll just have one slide on that. We, we are concerned about that. We are look, uh, have plans to address that. But I'll probably focus more today on you know, what people like to call the big one, you know, the, on the San Andreas Fault. The most probable large event would come from that. And, and what's important to note is all the aqueducts coming into our area cross the San Andreas Fault. And then the other issue is just a local, an in-basin earthquake and what impact that can have on pipelines, treatment plants, groundwater, things like that. So we're looking at all three of those areas, and we'll be covering them briefly today. So this slide is just to give you a little bit about the Bay Area, you know, a number of uh, faults up there. If you had a major one on any one of those, you could impact potentially, you know, the levees in the Bay Delta, and that could interrupt supplies from the, the State Water Project. So for a near-term uh, solution, Metropolitan has stockpiled materials so that we could quickly restore a channel you know, to supply water. But the long-term fix is really the California water fix and putting in the tunnels. That would be a more reliable approach to delivering water through that area. But I won't be touching on that today. I'll be focusing more on the Los Angeles area and what we're doing here. Okay, if we move down to Southern California, um, you see the red line, the dashed line, that's roughly the location of the San Andreas Fault. All the blue diagrams, these are Metropolitan's distribution uh, pipelines within the region. They're large diameter feeders that then supply the, the local agencies. 
And then in the green you see, uh, that's the state water project, so there's a west branch on the upper left part of the diagram that crosses the San Andreas Fault before supplying Lake Pyramid. And then the east branch parallels the aqueduct pretty closely for a while and then it crosses uh, the, um, further south on the uh, San Andreas. You see in the purple, that's the LA aqueduct it, and it crosses the San Andreas and then the blue line from the far right of the screen is the Colorado River aqueduct. And that's, so I guess, yeah, okay, I didn't know these are stepping in. So all these <coughs> crossings are important and uh, the one we studied the most, of course, is our own crossing of the San Andreas Fault. And just uh, two years ago, we did a detailed study looking at that specific crossing, get the geological experts in the area, tunneling engineers and others. We had to, first we figured out what might happen as far as movement of the fault. And you'll notice here on the bottom of this diagram, this is kind of a, a, a model that was developed of a tunnel where we do have a crossing of one of the splays of the San Andreas Fault. It's not the main part of the fault, but a worst case for us would be a failure through a tunnel. But it, worst case would be a four meter sideways, you know, lateral movement and one meter uplift. Very significant thing. We'll talk more about how, why are we prepared for that and what were our historic assumptions and are they valid. And then just real quick, uh, if we look in the base end, you know, there's a number of major faults. Uh, we can have in earthquakes on any one of these and just like we had with the Northridge earthquake or San Fernando earthquake, you know, these impact water facilities, are we prepared to respond to those? Okay, so that's the risk. But what I did want to do is give credit to the, the early designers and uh, geologists. Uh, from the beginning, Metropolitan has proact been proactive about seismic resilience, and this was pleasing to find out when we were reassessing what we did. But in this uh, 1938 engineering news record, there was a quote from one of our former general managers talking about when they did the design, what were they going to do at the fault crossings so that they were easier to repair, quicker to repair. So on purpose, they tried to cross all the active fault crossings in shallow uh, conduit or aqueduct, but not tunnel, so that they, they'd be easier to repair. In addition to that, they actually provided extra ver uh, hydraulic grade at three of the crossings in case there was uplift, you, you could still restore the, uh, the capacity of the aqueduct later on. Okay, real quickly, uh, I think we always learn from Hopefully we always learn from mistakes. We certainly learn from big events, big seismic events. So we kind of described our history, how it developed in the area of seismic resilience by these major um, earthquake events. So in the 30s, when they were designing the Colorado River Aqueduct, the San Francisco earthquake and the Long Beach earthquake were probably on the minds of the individuals designing the, the Colorado River Aqueduct. So that's probably why they were proactive about designing it to be more flexible in key areas and easier to repair. And then you go forward in time. The 1971 San Fernando earthquake did damage one of our treatment plants. Fortunately, it was just as the construction was being completed on it, so we were able to re, uh, restore the damage quickly. But what we did do is formed an earthquake committee at that time. And they were tasked with looking at what failed, why did it fail, what should our design standards be, and also what should we do in other parts of our system to be prepared for earthquakes. And then another 23 years later, there's a Northridge earthquake. We again had damage at that same facility, but it was much less. So it kind of showed the, the benefits of investing in seismic resilience. Uh, we also started doing um, more on the, in terms of uh, emergency response and uh, training exercises with earthquake themes and doing more vulnerability studies of our facilities and not just structures but systems as well. I think equally important after the Japan earthquake and uh, Christchurch New Zealand earthquake in 2011, I think the whole industry kind of took a step back and said our code, you know, minimum code standards enough? Or should we be, be designing for like performance-based designs of facilities? So it's, it's one thing to be able to exit a building safely. It's another to have the building ready to be, be used after, after the event. And the problem at uh, New Zealand was there's a number of buildings that 
people got out of, but they, they could not be occupied later. And uh, that was uh, really set the city back. So where are we at now? Uh, we have this, you know, as I said, a kind of integrated approach to seismic uh, resilience. We have five components. I'll have a slide for each one we can walk through. And, and probably really important to you, this one on the bottom, the coordination between agencies is really critical. Uh, all three of us, are, these agencies have aqueducts crossing the, uh, the San Andreas Fault, so we're looking at what can we do together as if we were one agency versus three. On the long-term planning side, um, it's very important. I mean, we have an integrated uh, water resources plan, the, the integrated resources plan, IRP. It's, it's focused on uh, developing a diversified water resource plan, which really helps in seismic resilience. You don't have all your eggs in one basket. System flexibility is also critical. Can we move water through all parts of our system? But emergency supplies, when we talk about a major event, become critical. So for any of those events we talk about, if we lost the state water either up north or closer to us or our own aqueduct, we can rely on emergency supplies in Diamond Valley Lake and other reservoirs to get us through that. Within engineering, we have a number of programs, and these are all focused on identifying and mitigating risks of structures, facilities, and systems. And, and, and then implementing projects that address those risks. So as I show on the bottom here, over the last 20 years, we've invested over $250 million in seismic upgrade of some of our older facilities. And it's really important to take a look at older facilities because the design loads have, you know, our knowledge of earthquakes has increased, uh, codes, uh, requirements have changed. So we take a look at what was designed in the 40s and say what is the forces now, what would be the, uh, the proper design at this time, and sometimes we have to go back and retrofit. And this example you see here is a filter building at the Weymouth plant. Another example uh, at the Lake Matthews uh, Reservoir, this is where the Colorado River, the end of the Colorado River aqueduct, and then we can supply uh, our treatment plants from here. We took a look at the old outlet tower and realized in a major event it could fall over. If you do that, you're going to cut off supply to millions of people. So we designed and constructed a new tower and then they cut off the old one so it wouldn't fail. Operations has a very important aspect to seismic resilience because no matter how much preparation you do, there's always going to be a surprise in events and you need to be ready for those. So it's not just having an emergency response organization, but having these people trained and ready. And it, and it also helps to have construction capabilities. Metropolitan's fortunate that we have construction equipment and crews. We also have a fabrication shop at our Laverne facility where we can work on very large equipment. We can even roll pipe, um, you know, uh, large diameter pipe over 12 feet. So this kind of capability can really help Metropolitan respond to events. We don't, you know, we can be immediately designing and fabricating things that will help us in the field restore services. Okay, the reporting component, again, you know, this, this is the report I talked about. You can go to our website. There's a, a link for it. It's a PDF version. And it, it walks through the history, what our approach is now. It identifies some of the goals that we're working towards over the next two years and kind of has a list of some of our key achievements over the past few decades. But what's important for us is um, by putting this together, this is a way for us to transfer knowledge between those of us that are involved now and those that will be involved in the future because they're always kind of have that succession planning component to, to things. So we can bring people up to speed quickly by coming to the report, understanding the history. It also has uh, a list of key reports that have been done in the past. So it's an easy way to get information to people. But it's also helping our internal coordination be more effective. And then the whole idea about going to the board each year is increasing that you know, transparency and accountability. So we set goals, we want to hit them because we don't want to be coming back to the board explaining why we're not doing these things. Okay, on to the fifth component. This is the coordination with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power and the 
California Department of Water Resources. Uh, it was actually, I think, in this room, or maybe the one across the way. We, we had a, we started this workshop as a, actually after um, Mayor Garcetti issued the Resilience by Design report, and one recommendation in there was to form a task force with the three agencies. So we read that and said, okay, that makes sense to us. We contacted Craig Davis at DWP. <laughs> he agreed. We contacted our um, people we work with at DWR. We started having meetings and pretty soon we realized the first thing we should really do is conduct a workshop where we can kind of lay our cards on the table. What have we done to look at the Colorado River aqueduct? What do we think would happen in a major event? How long do we think it would take us to repair? And each agency would, would did the same thing. And this was uh, very beneficial, kind of an eye opener too, because Metropolitans had uh, historic assumptions about this. And our historic assumption was that in a major event, all three aqueducts could be damaged, but they'd be full capacity after six months. Well, for Metropolitan, we did uh, confirm our, our assumption about our own aqueduct. We could restore capacity, or at least 80% of the capacity within six months. But for the LA aqueduct and for the state water project, both of those were longer durations than six months. So now the focus of the task force is what can we do about that? How can we shorten the, uh, the after event construction work? So we're, we're talking about implementing a MOU where we can uh, jointly respond to these events. Maybe, you know, maybe one aqueduct is more damaged than another or one's not damaged but the others are. We can kind of share resources to fix them faster. If multiple are, we talked about what are the priorities. You know, probably the CRA would be the first one we need to restore. It's also quite a bit of capacity, but then it'd be the West Branch of the State Water Pro Project would be the easier one to repair. So we're, we're trying to pre-think what could happen and how do we respond most effectively. And we just had another workshop last week where they're looking at uh, follow-up action items and, and then also kind of a, a discussion of is there any potential to intertie the LA and the state water project that might help in certain scenarios. Okay, so that's, I guess we got it just in time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yay.